I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I uh, really appreciate an audience, and I thought by this time most of you would have gone. <laughs> but you're here. It's wonderful. Uh, we're talking about the Middle Ages, the period from ancient history to the Renaissance. And we start with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, with the Battle of Adrianople in 378. Uh, this is a sort of a death knell for the Romans. They were totally disorganized in the battle, and they were defeated, and the emperor was killed. And we also end this period of time of uh, 1485. That's the Battle of Bosworth Field, which ends the Wars of the Roses. Uh, there are always results and consequences of such conflicts like this. And for the Romans, it was the reputation of invincibility that was tat in tatters. And then for the War of the Roses, it allowed the Renaissance to come in to Great Britain. Uh, we're going to have more commentary on England because we were a colony of Great Britain at one time. So that's why we are going to be fo focusing on that. Um, as a side note, we also will be, lang we have the language, we have the literature, we have the laws, we have the traditions of England. So some of the results of this particular action going on, we have a, an, an effect on language. We have many Romance languages. We like to think there are only about five or six, but there are lots more. So come to the class and find out how many there really, how many there really are. And each section in Europe has literature and has myths. Essentially, it is Christianity, which spread very quickly. And its main competitors were Islam, the Norse gods and Druids and people like that. Western Europe was also surrounded by other ascendant powers, such as the Muslims, the Vikings, Game of Thrones, right? Uh, the Ottomans, the Mongols, and the Eastern Europeans. They all were surrounding this territory of Western Europe. The art and sculpture and things of the period are of the period, and they're not all that great. But what is really something that takes off and is just stunning even today is Gothic architecture. I don't know if, uh, I take it most of you have been to Europe and what are you looking at, essentially, but the beautiful designs in architecture. Sculpture eventually showed some promise and painting showed some promise as once they invented perspective because in former paintings, I'm sure you've all seen them, where the people in the front of the picture are about the same size as those way back there. And that, that sort of distorts things. Uh, there is an effort to have literature, even though most people were illiterate, and uh, Bible translations. And we have also experiments in poetry and in drama there's something called the Wakefield series that is still in existence. Copies of them are in University of California, the Berkeley campus, and the plays are still given. There are sections that you go through the whole Bible in 36 sessions. And what, what happens there is that young people take part in these dramas and you have, for instance, uh, the wife of Mr. Noah. And she screams at him and says, you're going to build what? And so they have all of it. They even have it laced with comedy because they want the audience to understand it. And they also want the, the audience to appreciate that they are not just beasts of burden, that they have souls, that they have a, a gentler nature that they can work to develop. Music gets restructured. You know all those little scores that have 
the little black dots on them and so forth. Well, that's the work of one particular monk who decided to regularize music and to assign a sound to a particular note. Other uh, developments for uh, uh, music writing take a little bit longer, but this man was able to separate one tone from a half tone and to write it down. Uh, music gets, again, uh, composers and traveling troubadours, even though they were not necessarily high-class people. They were not treated as that either. Uh, we also have other artists of singers and entertainers, acrobats, uh, puppeteers. And then there is also heraldry, which is the design of your own coat of arms. And it's in color. Why do you, why do you think it's in color? Namely, because the people who looked at it couldn't read or write. And if they were going into battle, they wanted to be on the right side of whatever it is they were fighting over. So we have color in heraldry. We also have a monumental contribution of laws. We have been arguing for more than 800 years over things like executive privilege. Just yesterday, we had a vote in our Senate that made executive privilege something that Mr. Trump is going to use. Things like uh, uh, due process. If you're going to hurt somebody or deprive him or her of property, you'd better have a system that recognizes that this is something legal. And this was all embodied in the Magna Carta. And how old is the Magna Carta that we've still been working on this? It's more than 800 years. So we still haven't settled it, and we're probably going to have to live a few more uh, years before we sort of straighten out executive privilege, too. Uh, it's um, the experimentation in medicine. It isn't necess <coughs> excuse me, necessarily to make you sort of wince, but uh, some of the treatments for wounds and so forth date from the Bible and were used by none other than George Washington when his troops got, uh, got hurt. Do you all know the story of the Good Samaritan, where the uh, Samaritan pours in what and what to the wounds? Well, he didn't have vinegar, so he poured in wine and then oil to sort of soothe things down. That's e almost exactly what George Washington used, and this was the status of medicine for centuries, and then also bleeding people because they thought the illness was in your blood. So we've, we've made a few steps of progress since that. Uh, <clears throat> the food, we will look at food preparation and food preservation because in Northern Europe, the growing season is pretty short and nobody enjoys starving. Uh, it's a very colorful period and Hollywood loves to make it even more so. And Hollywood does get it right for uh, pageantry and for color and for drama. And I would recommend several movies for you to see. One is The Lion in Winter. And it involves Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry II and Richard and John and all those colorful characters. The actual play, the event that they're uh, talking about in the play, that did not happen. But they all talk about events that did happen. And Eleanor tries again to uh, uh, rally her sons against their father. Also Camelot, that's part of the myth, the Arthurian myth. And then Beckett, the priest who was sort of killed in a church. Anyway. Hollywood gets it a bit wrong when they have dogs uh, eating with the, the adults and, the, and snarling and growling at each other over a bone. Come on. Uh, that's really kind of crude, and Eleanor made sure that she did not have that uh, at her table. Uh, there are other colorful uh, events that do occur in this uh, branch of time, and I wanted to close by showing you how the Scots do it. 
This particular tartan is my late husband. This is McIntyre. Okay. This is from my family. This is McNeil, one of the oldest tartans around. And this is the product of a group of Scottish weavers. And it was dedicated to a very lovely lady, posthumously. This is dedicated to Princess Diana. And that's about all I have to say. So thank you. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the class. Thank you. We are almost done. We have a representative from Jim Eggerman.